to John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, John 9. And the title of the message is, A Blind Man That Can See. A Blind Man That Can See. And we're going to start off reading. Um, we're going to cover the chapter, but we're going to uh, read together. I'm reading from the New King James Version, but verses 1 through 23 to start off with. So verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, and he was, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, and the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay, and with the saliva he anointed the man, the eyes of the blind man, with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing glory. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? Verse 11. He answered and said, A man called Jesus made the clay, anointed my eyes, and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I was washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had sent, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, and he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the, the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was um, that he believed in Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this courageous blind man that could see. He believed you and he received the grace of God. And then he also stood up for you when he was persecuted. Immediately, when he got the blessing and he stood firm and he received the greatest blessing which was salvation and friendship with Christ so that's the greatest gift that we can receive in this life is salvation and friendship with Christ we pray that we'll learn from this blind man that learned how to see in Jesus name amen amen well this is a little joke here but a little girl was in her children's uh, church and, uh, and she, um, she listened to the story uh, from, from her Sunday school teacher, but she didn't hear it exactly right. But uh, she heard about how God had created 
um, you know, man and woman. And, um, and so how Adam, the teacher said, was very lonely, and he was talking to the animals, and, and he didn't really have anybody to talk to. So this is the little girl's version that, that God put the man to sleep and, and took out his brains and gave it to the woman. <laughs> so, of course, she got the story wrong. She got the story wrong. But in our society, a lot of men live as if they don't have brains, right? Because we need to be led by the Spirit of God. We need to, amen, we need to take our leadership, right, as men in society and be the head and, 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 and guide the family and such. So, anyways, um, it was, uh, and, and a lot of times people are led by uh, lust in society and by greed in society, but we want to be known for being led by the Spirit of God, the self-control of God, that Jesus is first in our life. And so, um, but the story is that the rib came out, right? And, uh, and the DNA and that husband and wife are to walk side by side together. It's a beautiful marriage right there, right? Walking side by side together. So we'll, we'll give her, the little girl, a break, right? She didn't get it exactly right. But God wants us to get it right. He wants to open our eyes. And in this story here... This man, it, this is amazing because the detail of John chapter 9, it, it shows the whole scenario and it, and it really happened, but it's also how God works in people's lives that he opens our eyes and, and as soon as we're saved and we come to Christ, we, we start getting persecuted by others like because we've been changed and, and, and this man uh, can show us a good example of a man. And then also, he was blind, but... Other people could see in the natural, but yet they were really blind. It's quite, it's quite a brain twister there. And so we need to look at this and, uh, and that we can all have blind spots, okay? We all have blind spots. That's why Jesus needs to be our vision. Be my vision, right? Of Lord in my heart, amen? Because God has to take those blind... We all have blind spots, and we need Jesus to help us get that 2020 vision, right? That we can see appropriately. We can see the way God wants us to see. And he's willing to change our sight. Now, there was a big question here. And this is a theological question. And it's still answered to, you know, it's still asked this, you know, in our times. But verses 1 and 2, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was, uh, blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? All right, so this is a question that's, that's always asked, but the reason that this man, what came into this condition, is that we live in a fallen world. It's called original sin. It's called that God made Adam and Eve perfect in the garden perfect emotionally spiritually they were one with god they were meant to live forever but because of free will and wrong choices they listened to the devil and the devil lied to them and stole uh, what god had wanted them to have but now they can get it back through going to the lamb of god we can get back what was stolen in the garden but there was still great damage in the garden what satan did this is why we have got to learn to hate evil. We've got to learn how to, to hate sin and, and, and hate the works of the devil. Now, we can't, you know, challenge the devil to a duel and, and come out with your 38 and say, I'm going to take you on. I'm going to get out my 12 gauge and we're going we're gonna to battle this out. Well, you're going to lose. I'm going to lose, okay? But if we... If we have our names written in the Lamb's book of life and we submit to Christ humbly and cover ourselves with his blood and do spiritual warfare and use the gifts that God has given to us, we can take authority over the world, the flesh and the devil because he is the one who has destroyed and, and we can get back what the enemy has stolen. But we have to take heed to the word of God. And so this man, that's a big question, theological question, uh, what, did this man sin or did his parents sin? 
And then Jesus said in verse 3, he answers it very clearly. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, no matter what the situation is in this world, no matter how, how complicated it becomes, if we lean into Christ and the call of God, he will turn it around for a testimony. Every time, every time. We, we've learned that from the scriptures. You know that my, um, one of my, our cousins was, was, uh, had a, um, a brain hemorrhage um, when she was very young, and the doctors uh, went and had to operate on the brain and, and broke the myoptic nerve, and she was blind. And so Cindy, this is on my wife's side, and, um, and of course, in the beginning, the parents, uh, m uh, my uncle and aunt, were devastated, but they said, Lord, you know, you've got a plan and a purpose. And um, so in this purpose, Cindy has grown up to be such a neat servant of Christ, and she is so focused on Christ and the will of God in her life. She's a true overcomer, has ministered. But listen to this, that her brother, Carl, our cousin, in this adversity that hit his sister, he became a, a software engineer, and he created a Braille uh, software that's used to this day to help hundreds of thousands of people all around the world through Braille. So because he wanted his sister to learn how you know, to read and felt the compassion and the anguish that she went through, he ends up creating a software. Isn't that beautiful? That, that helps blind people all around the world so that they can, they can read and, and, and advance in their life. But we need to believe God always. And um, so when it comes down to curses, the Bible says this in, in Exodus 20, uh, verse 5, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you that you live long on the earth. So there's a blessing, and then it's repeated in Ephesians as well. So when people do not obey God and, and honor their parents in the way that the Holy Spirit guides, there are consequences to the family. There's consequences that occur. And, um, and so, but God is always able to redeem. And, um, but there was false teaching, false teaching that the rabbis said this. Now listen to this. The rabbis said that, Children in the womb, this is, this is a false teaching. They said that children in the womb sin, and that's why they're born a certain way. And so, of course, that's weird. Everybody say, that's weird. That the baby is a baby, a beautiful baby being formed, right? And that there's nothing to do with what the baby's thinking or in the formation, right? But it's, it's false teaching. But you know that they teach that in Buddhism and Hinduism, that you are, you are cursed. If, you're, if you are from a delete family, you are born into that lower class, and that's the way you're going to live the rest of your life. So you're a sign. And so all this kind of mysticism and wrong teaching, and, and the, the reality is, is that Jesus died to break the curse. Jesus died to break every curse, every generational curse. And we don't have to get like all super spiritual about it and start naming all the... Just claim the blood of Jesus. I have every curse broken off of my life in Jesus' name. And we have to claim it and walk in it. Amen. And not sit there, well, I've got to name this, this curse and I've got to name this and i got... Listen, Jesus has already done the work. Isn't that great? You're free. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you're free. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, right? It's not all this religious stuff. So Jesus is saying that this happened. It's a part of the original sin. It's a part of the fall. But I'm going to bring glory to my name through this man being born blind. And he's going to see. Amen. So it was very uh, uh, you know, unusual. It was uh, supernatural. But he tells him in verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming and no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, 
which is translated sin. And he washed and he came back seeing. Amen. So it's supernatural. And uh, there's something in that saliva, Jesus, amen. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but it, he is, he is the, the one who has the anointing that he wants to get into our life that breaks the yoke, that, that makes the difference. And that's why we need to know that it's all through Christ. Now, he made that mud. How many of us here like to play with mud when we were kids? All right, I did on a rainy day and, you know, and then... Uh, had a friend, Andy Cullinane, up in the, uh, up in the mountains of their Saddleback, and he made a, an adobe house, you know. So we were up there helping him make some adobe. That was cool, you know. He was an eccentric, and he made an adobe house up there, you know, over by Dana Point. But, hey, one mud story, a good mud story, is when we lived by the Gallatin, when we pastored in Montana, and we had the youth group, and we, it was really cool because the, the, the river was way down. It was, it was later in the summer, and we took all the youth out, and it was very safe. And we, we ran, and we had a, just a real, real good mud fight. Oh, man, we got into it, you know, on the river in there, and you could dive in, get cleaned up, and get a bunch of mud on you again, you know, and everybody made it out okay. We were better for it. But... Uh, we all kind of like playing in mud. At least we like getting cleaned up from the mud, right? But Jesus, you know, what, what's going on here? He, there, were many, there were two other times. He, um, he, this one deaf man, he put, his, he put his fingers in the deaf man's ear. He spit and put spit on his tongue. And the man's ears opened up and, and he could speak because he stuttered before. So that was, you know, a supernatural healing. That's found in Mark uh, 733. And then there's another one where the blind man, Jesus literally, he spit in both of his eyes, in both eyes. And then he said, what do you see? And then the man said, this is in Mark 823, he says, I see men walking as trees. <laughs> and so Jesus then, he puts his hands on the man's eyes again and then the man says, I can see everything, you know, and he was healed. So there's another healing there that he's, he's doing. But, um, you know, spit and dirt. And um, you see how this really isn't something that, that I can model here as a, as a pastor here at harvest time. Come on up, you know, and be healed, you know. It, I, I think we get some wrong publicity, right? We get some wrong publicity if, you know, the pastor, especially after COVID and, and masks, and he's spitting on people, you know. And what people do to try and, you know, you know uh, just to, to conjure up, you know, the power of God. But we don't have to conjure up the power of God. I remember there was a man named Smith Wigglesworth, and he was a plumber in England, and he had a supernatural ministry, and, and he used to stutter, and then God healed his tongue. His wife was a better preacher than him, and then all of a sudden he said, I want to preach, and, and he got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, started speaking in tongues, and, and that's why I became a plumber, because I like Smith Wigglesworth, because he was a plumber. So anyways, it was a good motivation in Bible college. But Smith Wigglesworth was this strong, you know, Englishman, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he punched people in the gut. When, when this, one, this one woman had a growth and everything, and, and Smith punched her in the gut, and, uh, and the growth came out, and she was healed, okay? Now, I, I will not try and, you know, model that. I had this, this one young minister wannabe, and he's, unfortunately, he got too zealous, and he's not serving the Lord now, but he, he wanted to punch people, you know? He was, uh, he, he wanted to punch people, and the thing is, is that you can't, you can't copy or conjure up, is that Jesus did this. Jesus is God, by the way, and Jesus did this supernaturally, and it's also, to us, it's a sign. Isn't he the one that formed man and woman out of clay, right? Isn't he the one that raised man up? And so the very creator did this, but it is a good example to us that we don't have to follow this type of ministry. We're just glad that Jesus did it, right? Amen. And aren't you glad that I'm not spitting at you? You know, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. But, but these men, they got healed and they were glad. And he told them, <clears throat> go wash in the pool of Siloam. And uh, Siloam was this, uh, 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 this uh, 
well that they had dug outside the city, and Hezekiah did it, and it was 1,500 feet, and it was their water source when the city was under siege. And go and wash in this pool of Siloam. The Siloam, also Jesus was there in John 3, uh, 7, 37, and said that, you know, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So it's at this rock of Siloam. It's at this place of the Holy Spirit where we can get the new life, where we can get this new life. And so the man goes and obeys God, goes to Siloam, which means sent, and then he gets his healing, and he, he, he can see, and he's so excited. And um, also, God sent us the Holy Spirit, right? Because that's what it means. It means Siloam means sent. They, they sent the water. Hezekiah sent the water in through this tunnel system into the city, right? And so God sent us power through the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts chapter 2 so that we could pray in the Spirit, so that we could have this source of, of resurrection life and power bubbling up within us. So it's symbolic, but it's also happening here. That's why God got angry at Moses when Moses went and, 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 he, and he had every right in the natural, you know. The people kind of wore him out, and he was a little bit frustrated, and he struck the rock, right? He said, yeah, strike the rock, let the water come forth, and, and the water came forth. But then God said, hey, hey, <laughs> Moses, what a, it's going to be great to meet him in heaven. But he said, you, you didn't speak reverently to the rock because that rock was Christ. That was the, the rock that, you know. So anyways, Moses, um, he couldn't go into the promised land, but um, that was also in God's plan because the Jews were worshiping Moses. And if Moses had gone into the promised land, symbolically, they would have more reason to worship Moses. So God stopped him from, and, and he buried him on Mount Nebo, and so he could see the promised land. But the problem is with these Jewish people that are religious, is they're worshiping Moses. And they're not worshiping Jesus who is before them. So this man is getting this amazing healing here. And, okay, so he's healed. The man is healed. And all of a sudden, they're persecuting him. Can you imagine? But, but it really is kind of very similar when you and I get saved. When we come to Christ, when we say, you know what? I'm no longer going to go out and party with my friends. I, I have found that my old lifestyle got me into a lot of trouble. And, and, and I hurt myself. I hurt a lot of people. I repent of my sins. And I receive Jesus as my Savior. And, and that, see, that's a true repentance. Of course, God works with us wherever we're at. But as soon as we want to better ourselves, as soon as we want to live a different life, then people come up, do you think you're holier than thou? Come and party with me. Come. Come away. Let's, let's get together. And, uh, but see, the, the true believer has to say, no, I've been changed. I've been forgiven. I, I've got, the, I've got the, the real deal now, and, and, and I want to cherish it. And so, see, that's why we have to separate ourselves from the world. But this man is a great example here, right? He's like, all of a sudden, he can see, and he's like, I don't, I don't know. Seeing is exciting, but boy, there's sure some mean faces around me you know, that he's looking at. And um, so our faith, you know, we have opportunity to give testimony. And um, people may refute our logic. They may refute our theology. Maybe we don't have, you know, a super a good yet understanding of theology. But you know what they can't refute is your testimony, right? Once I was blind, but now I can see. Once I was addicted, but now I'm set free, right? Once I, once I you know, couldn't respect myself or other people, but now I can respect myself, respect the opposite sex. I can, amen, live uprightly, right? Because I've been changed, right? We have a testimony, and nobody can refute that. And, of course, they'll fight against it. But now, this is amazing, truly. Let's go uh, to verse 24, and I'm going to finish reading. But it goes into an elaborate detail about this man's persecution, and then he finally, you know, gets saved, you know. Because, see, he was healed physically, 
but he still needed to be saved spiritually. And that's why we can't chase miracles or we can't, a miracle isn't going to save you or I. A miracle is a blessing, right? But, a, but we have to go beyond a miracle and we, we need to be changed. And so let's just look at this uh, from verse, uh, John chapter 9, verse 24. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Well, that's, that's not good news to this, <laughs> this poor man. But he's not. He's really a great hero. Verse 25. And he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know is though I was blind, but now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already that he but you did not listen. Why do you do you want to hear him? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. And we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. <laughs> the religious people, you know, uh, they're, 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 they are in our society. Verse 35, And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is, is talking with you. And when he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, and that those who do not see, may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. All right, so this man is standing in his testimony. And, um, but there's a progression. Everybody say a progression. And this is what we want to learn from this, this brave man uh, who got uh, saved. First off, all right, he, he, is, he hears the gospel and Jesus heals him. That's verse 11. Then this man is questioned and he says in verse 17, Jesus is a prophet. So he believes that he's a prophet and then in verse 33, he says, Jesus is from God. See, it's, it's, it's developing faith. That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then he finalizes it in verse 37, and he says, Jesus, you are God. See, that's what he said in his terms, is that Jesus said, I am the son of God. And he, you get that from Daniel where Daniel gets the vision in, in Daniel 7 and of the four kingdoms. And then, in fact, let's go to Daniel. This just shows uh, how powerful this man uh, saw the vision of who Jesus is. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And he says, I was watching in the night visions and beheld one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then 
To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So this blind man, when he gets and Jesus says to him, I am the son of man, this is what he saw. He says, his eyes were open. Everybody say, his eyes were open. He could see. He could see spiritually. He could see naturally now. He knew that Jesus was it. He was what the, everybody had hoped for. And it is sad, isn't it, that the scribes and Pharisees as a whole, we know that, that many of them did believe and come to Christ as, you know, there was a remnant, but the majority didn't. They hardened their heart. And so instead of them seeing, they're, they're like irritated with Jesus that they were worried that this blind man, can you imagine a man born blind and they were worried that he was healed on a Sabbath, on a Saturday? Is that, turn to your neighbor and tell them, that's trivial, right? That's, that's goofy. That's goofy. A blind man was healed, and they're worried about, right? They're worried about that he was healed, you know, on, on a Sabbath day. So it just shows how superficial they were, right? And then they tried to disprove the healing, but the man kept coming back, even went to his parents and said, is this your boy? Well, that's my boy. But he's of age, ask him, because they were concerned that, that if they got, if they got um, thrown out of the synagogue, that was their social security. They didn't get any social security. They didn't get any benefits, so it would be a big loss. But guess what? They tossed him out of the synagogue, the man, right? So see, when we, when we come to Christ, we lose our life, but then we find our life in him. And, and that's what really our nation needs. That's what people need to see is changed lives. Not, not little superficial change here and there. God will take whatever we give him. And we need to thank God for our salvation. But we need to also go deeper in him and say, Lord, is there anything blocking my vision? I mean, am I, you know, consumed with, you know, lust? Am I consumed with you know, a desire to be high? Am I consumed with materialism? I mean, what, what are blo what's blocking my compassion for God or my love for other people? Only you, you know, can, can talk to God about that. But God wants to take those barriers down. And he wants to give us a clear vision of his love for us. And, and that's where really true abundant life is. And like, uh, you know, John Newton, he said, once I was blind, now I see, he wrote, Amazing Grace. And, um, and so we need, a, we need a John Newton moment, right? Where we just say, Lord, take away the blindness. And, and Lord, let me see you like I've never seen you before. And love you and be loved like I've never been loved before. Because that's, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom of God. Is that he, there's no barriers. He, he loves us and he wants us to have no guilt, no shame, no fear. He wants us to come to him in confidence. And, um, but we do have to stand up and uh, suffer some persecution uh, for being able to see uh, properly because then we expose the world and how corrupted it is, right? And so then we got to love the people because once we were lost, right, in darkness. And so we have compassion. Amen. Let's all stand up together. And.